Okay, should I take my mask off here? No. Okay, greetings everyone. My name is Bob Hibbs. Thank you for joining us today for this very important live stream. I'm sure we can all agree the appetite for uh, accepting high ta more high taxes, uh, this needs to stop. It begs the question, is there not a better way to control our costs? On this note, I would like to introduce our guest speaker, Tom Price, who has spent many hours accumulating data for this presentation. Tom has more than 50 years of successful concept, detail, project, and maintenance engineering, together with project management experience in supply chain, construction, heavy industrial, and chemical industries. He has been very concerned with our, where municipal government has been taken the city of Greater Sudbury and in September of 2018 made presentations forecasting a financial tsunami for our city. Tonight Tom will be presenting the first of a two-part presentation updating that prediction. Tom, take it away. Thank you very much, Robert. We are social distance now, so I will take off the mask and I won't waste a lot of time. I'll get right into the presentation. Uh, in 2018, I presented to a number of groups as well as I forwarded the presentation to councillors forecasting that Greater Sudbury was in, facing a financial tsunami. It's been suggested with all of the best intentions that maybe I should be calling this problems and solutions. It's neither. This will be a matter of presenting facts. Whether it's uh, problems or solutions will be your perceptions that you derive from the facts you see. Unfortunately, the predicted issues have in fact proceeded as predicted. Financial indicators from around the world were indicating a coming recession. Those, were in those indicators have become reality but remain unheeded locally. The who, what, and how of our presentation tonight, uh, you just heard Bob Hibbs introduce me as the presenter, Tom Price. Uh, what Bob didn't say is that him and Michael Vagnini have reviewed the financial and the statistical data that I have used for this presentation. They are two of our most experienced financial analysts in the city. Uh, well, at least they have the longest record of being at it. So. Uh, they were very gracious and agreed to audit what I had done. The what? This will, be, this will be presented in two phases. The first phase is tonight, and I'll be presenting what the world economics was able to predict and how CGS economics furthered that prediction of a recession. Phase two, which will be at a later date, will go over the taxpayer capacity to be able to finance that. The how, I will not be putting up information bullets. I will not use 10 second sound bites. And I will not use propaganda sheets. Instead, I will present you with hard facts. And these hard facts have been derived from approved budget binders from 2014 to 2020. Before I get into that, it's important to know who works for whom. And in our, in our democracy that we all celebrate, the taxpayers are the boss, or they're supposed to be the boss. The councillors, MPPs, and MPs are all supposed to work for us. As well, city staff works for council. And with dismay, I have heard some councillors express their belief that they work for the city. They don't. They work for you and I as taxpayers. In fact, that is reinforced by the Ontario Municipal Act. It says councillors are to represent the public and to consider the well-being and interests of the municipality. So who pays for everything? Well, I'll also clarify that. This is not celebrated quite as enthusiastically as you can see from the faces in the, excuse me a moment, Thank you. Uh, as you can see from the faces in the photograph, the taxpayers pay 100% of the, 
of what all of our governments spend. Who pays for our municipal services? We pay 100% of it. Some of it goes through the federal government and they administer 0.22% of our local expenses. The provincial government administers 21.6% and our local city council administers 78%. But we pay the full shot. Moving forward, I uh, can't move forward yet because the Municipal Act states that councillors are to maintain the financial integrity of the municipality. So let's take a quick look at how they do that. From 2014 to 2020, our council made decisions that increased the operating budgets at three times the cost of living rate. They approved projects and increases to projects that mean those projects are out of control. They have deferred maintenance on infrastructure every year and our infrastructure maintenance is now 2.2 billion behind, going towards 3.2 billion in 2026. Our municipal services have been shrinking. They take away lifeguards, they take away crossing guards, they take away nickel and dime items to pay for their excesses. In phase two, we will talk about the reality of this. So to give you an indication of where this information comes from that I've used, I'll quickly show you the operating budgets from the city. And I don't expect anyone to read these, but this is a page out of the budget binder for 2014. This is the page from 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, and 2020. What those budget sheets don't show you is what they used to forecast our economic conditions going into 2020 and beyond. This is out of the 2020 budget binder. What they used for the economic outlook for Sudbury was from the census of 2016. The data was four years old before they used this as an outlook, economic outlook. Massive changes have occurred in those four years. Those four year old items are no longer valid. Why this was used, you will have to ask your counselor. Going back to the main slide, information from those sheets was used in a spreadsheet and this has been audited by Mr. Hibbs and Mr. Bagnini to make sure that I didn't cheat on any numbers. And they are from the approved budget binders that you just saw. This shows the amount of increase each year and what that percentage was relative to the year before. It also calculates what the increase has been since 2014 to 2020 and what that percentage is. I also looked at what has happened to our manpower, city employment. In 2001, we were promised that we could get more efficient, have less employees, and save a lot of money by amalgamation. We'll see how that works. So the economic facts from 2014 to 2020, that's six years of performance. In those six years, we've had 2% population shrinkage, 9% cost of living increase, 23% increase in CGS spending, 27% increase in what the CGS gets as revenue from all of us locally, 26% increase in property tax, and you should realize that 95% of our property taxes go to paying salaries and benefits. Only 5% goes to doing any real work. That 5% is uh, plus money from elsewhere is what pays for our changes. 21% of the increase in, it's the increase in salaries and benefits over those six years. 62% increase in debt payments. 29% increase in user fees. And user fees pay 22% of the CGS spending. 12% increase in provincial grants. Provincial grants pay 22% of CGS spending. 
You'll see how this all fits together in a moment. Federal grants only pay 0.22% of CGS spending. In addition to all of these expense increases, the city has approved or has deferred infrastructure, as I mentioned, by 2.2 billion. That's how much we're behind in our maintenance. They've also, this past year, approved a $1 billion net zero emissions project over the next 30 years. That's $30 million per year. And we're now facing an unknown cost of the pandemic. So to summarize, most all of those were before the, pad, the pandemic. The financial economic crisis was not created by the pandemic. However, it has created and become a catalyst for global economic correction. To put that, what you just saw in a graphics form, the green line in the middle of this graph, to the left of that was what I predicted in 2018. Those are the percent increases each year over the year before in those in revenue streams. The blue is inflation. The red is local taxes, property taxes. The gray is the total revenue that the city gets from the population. The yellow is the total expenses of the city, the total revenue. Now, as you move across to the right into 2020, the trend lines from 2018 didn't diminish. They kept going on the same line, as you can see. The black line at the top, in fact, is even a bit elevated now. The blue line of inflation, and that's what dictates a lot of the incomes in Greater Sudbury, that has remained relatively flat, about 2% every year. What does this mean? Well, inflation increased by 9%, 46.6 million in six years. Budget increases increased by 23%, or 116.6 million in those six years. Local revenue, what they take from your and my pockets, increased by 100 million over six years. And property tax increases, although they're only 24% increase, increased by 55.7 million. So it's obvious from this that the local revenue is growing at a much rapid, more rapid rate than property taxes, but it's all coming from our pockets. This is the tsunami I was talking about. It's now cresting. Household incomes have remained relatively flat and the tsunami is going to engulf us and watch out for the back toe, under toe. To illustrate where the city gets their money, you can see at the top of this chart that they get a fair amount of money from the federal provincial government, but the rest of it comes from municipal. And these are increases. These aren't the total they get. These are the increases since 2014. Federal has increased by 0.22%, negligible. Provincial grants have increased by 21.6% or 14 million. Property taxes have increased by 60 million or 25% and that is 49.9% of our budget. Licensing and leases have increased by 30%. That's only 1% of our budget though. The rest are sort of immaterial, except that they are growing by large amounts. This is only part of the story though. If you take a look from here, and you'll see item six on there says from reserves, and that has grown by 53.64% over the last six years. Although it's only 3% of the, the revenue, that's a big jump. Our reserve fund balances in 2015 were $160.5 million. In the 2020 budget forecast, those reserves had been reduced to $100 million. That's a $65 million bleed from our reserves. And you have to keep in mind that every year the reserves are funded there's money comes out of our operating budget into those reserves every year to try to top it up. Those contributions to the reserve have not been keeping up. 
Why? Well, our budget has overruns. And this is a listing of the overruns by year since 2015. Maybe coincidental, but it's hard to believe that the overruns are 68 million in the same six years. 65 million drop in reserves, 68 million in overruns. Could be coincidental, I don't know. I've been asked if this continues, how long before our reserve is bankrupt? Well, if the rate of depletion and the rate of contributing to the reserve continues at the current rates, it looks like about five years. Salaries and benefits. I've thrown in 2003 here for the benefit of those who are concerned what's happened uh, to the savings and the reduced manpower we were supposed to see from amalgamation. Uh, in 2003, we had 1,800 employees. The cost of those 1,800 employees in today's dollars was 177 million. That's escalated from the actual cost in 2003 of 132 million. So those are today's dollars at 177 million. However, if we're only looking at the six years from 2014, we had 2,500 employees in 2014. We now have 2,608. That's an increase of almost 100 employees, or 4%. The cost of those employees, at 2,500 employees, was 224 million. It is now 270 million. The cost has increased by 46 million, or 46.6 or an increase of 21%. The, zero, the population from 2003 to 2020 has been zero. We are the same population as we were in 2003. The population <clears throat> from 2014 to 2020 has dropped by 2.2%. The salaries and benefits have grown, as I mentioned, by 21% and inflation has only increased by 8.9%. It should be noted that 527 of those employees, or 20% of them, are on the sunshine list. That covers the city revenues and the city uh, employment. So I also mentioned that large projects are out of control. This is the KED. This is one example of what happens to our large projects. In 2013, we were promised a free arena by OLG if we would welcome a casino. Would cost the city taxpayers nothing. In 2015, Coldwell Banker did estimates for the city to refit the existing arena would cost 12 million. Or if we refurbished it, it would cost 50 million, and if we built a new one, 65 million. The current council invited companies and developers to submit a number of large projects that they would like to proceed with. In those was the True North Strong, now seen as KED. That was proposed as a private consortium at zero cost to the city. Later in, 2015, in 2016, I'm sorry, when we did the priority selection of large projects, the cost had gone up a little bit. And when councillors did the selection and chose the KED, the cost to the city was presented as $775,000. As well, they indicated a $500,000 a year revenue from taxation and ticket sales. Over 30 years, that's $15 million in revenue, if it had said stayed as a private consortium. However, by 2017, they came back with a cost of $80 million. And in 2017, CGS took over the project at a cost of $100 million. That project, including interest, has now grown to 180 million. That's a terrible out of control project from zero to 180 million. How would we finance that? Well, in March of this year, 
the city took out a bullet debenture and financed the KED, the junction, Municipal Road 35, some bridges and culverts, playgrounds, and McNaughton Water Treatment Plant for $200,200,000. The interest cost alone on that bullet debenture will be $145 million over 30 years. So the total cost of those projects won't be $200 million, it will be $345 million. What are our annual payments on that? Well, the annual interest will be $4.8 million. Annual principal will be $6.6 .6 million. That goes into a sinking fund towards lump sum payout of $200 million at the end of 30 years. We have to put away sufficient money every year for 30 years to make a lump sum payment at the end of 30 years of $200 million. So the annual payment will be, out of our pockets, will be $11.5 million. The city will tell you that that's not true because they have invested the money and they're getting interest on that money. Well, the interest they're getting would have been our interest if they hadn't taken out the loan. So that interest is coming out of our pocket. So that is a cost to us taxpayers. Why? Well, twice. Once in June of 2018 and again in June of 2019. The city solicited a credit rating from Standard & Poor's Global. In their report, and you've heard them brag about this, that we have a double A rating. The city has bragged that this is a great thing, that we have such a high rating. Well, in their report, Standard & Poor's states that Sudbury has proven its ability to increase taxes to match operating needs and effectively control spending. In other words, if you've got a problem with money, just raise taxes and the people will pay it. Secondly, they stated that approximately 80% of our operating revenues are internally modifiable, primarily from taxes, fees, and user charges. In other words, if we can't sell a tax increase, we'll increase user charges and get the money anyway. So from a lender point of view, hey, this is a sure bet. And it was such a sure bet then in their waivers, or, or caveats, I guess, at the end of their report, they stated the statement that says, the main sources are financial statements and budgets as provided by the issuer, which was the city of Greater Sudbury. While Standard & Poor's has obtained information from sources it believes to be reliable, Standard & Poor's does not perform an audit and undertakes no duty of due diligence or independent verification of any information it receives. They thought enough of those first two points up above to give us a lender's two thumbs up. No one ever mentioned whether the borrowers had it one thumbs up or two thumbs down. All they were concerned about was that the lenders were happy. Yeah, they'll lend us money. Why not? Going from there, we have to look at how the city does estimating. Right now, the estimating is done with what are called top-down budget costing. And that is shown at the left of this slide. And on the right of the slide is bottom up. So before you do any estimating, the first thing you should be doing is separating your wants from your needs. You need to fund your needs before you consider wants. This isn't done. We now take away from our needs to help fund the wants. However, even in spite of that, if you go to whether top down or bottom up, if the intent of your budget is just a simple overview, top down works. People use it all over. But if you want detailed control of your cost, you need to do a bottom up estimate. I've been, as Bob mentioned, in project management for 50 some years. Project control demands that you do bottom-up costing. Otherwise, you have no control over your budget. Task clarity. Again, you need clearly defined tasks. In a, a top-down, they are poorly defined. They are overviews. Environment. Is it a stable financial environment? 
Are you facing a recession? Are you not facing a recession? Are you facing a boom cycle? This is, this, uh, the top down can be used in a volatile environment because you've got lots of room to play. And to illustrate that, at a meeting on the Twin Pads Arena in Valcaran, at, counts, or at the uh, community services meeting, somebody asked a question about a sunshade. The answer from the consultant was, well, don't worry about it. There's enough money in the budget to cover it because it wasn't in the previous cost. But there's enough money there. Hey, this is a top-down budget. Time duration. Typically on a project, you have very tight time constraints. You need to start paying back that money at the earliest possible date. As you've seen just now, we have a 30-year time duration on $200 million loan. Accuracy. In a top-down, eh, maybe 60% accurate. As you've seen with the KED, the accuracy on that initial $0 is now $180 million. Accuracy on a bottom-up has to be close. If you overrun by 25%, as a project manager, you'll be fired. It's that simple. So what does this mean? Well, top-down, the city starts with a cost overview. They get together and decide what's acceptable. Is a 3% budget accept increase acceptable? Three and a half, four, and they collectively agree on co with consensus, and last year they agreed that three and a half percent was okay. We could charge three and a half percent more this year and sell it. Once you do that, every department below, every factor you see below that simply increases their budget by three and a half percent. Doesn't matter what they need, they increase it by three and a half percent. Once that has happened, if they don't spend that, they lose it in the next year. So the onus is on them now that they have the three and a half percent to find places to spend it. Well, if instead of that you approach it from the taxpayer point of view, the taxpayer looks at wasted taxes. Where are we wasting money? And I think everybody watching this will agree that patching potholes time after time after time after time is wasting taxes. That's what we see as taxpayers. We see double billings. We see billings, we pay taxes for fire services. And if you have a fire, you will pay even more because they will bill you. If you have an accident and fire comes out to the accident scene, they will bill your insurance company for the call out in addition to being there at taxpayer leisure, or courtesy. You've already paid them, but they will bill you again. Needs versus wants, well, we've seen that. Cascading cost to taxpayers, this is my favorite. I've been told many times by city personnel, by counselors, that user fees are not taxes. They are, they're cascading taxes. When a user fee of water supply is increased, who do you think is gonna pay at the gas station for that increased water cost. They will add it to the cost of your gasoline. You will be paying as taxpayer. Who do you think will be paying the extra cost for the grocery store for that water? You will be, because the grocery store will add it to their cost of the food to you. So it cascades down through those individuals back to the everyday taxpayer. Service level changes. Well, I've already mentioned, they cut out crossing guards, they cut out swimming guards, they cut out any all kinds of services. This year they wanted to close some of our camping campgrounds to save $80,000 to help pay for $14 million in COVID costs. $80,000 is coffee fund to that $14 million. Besides, why would that $14 million not get paid out of our reserve funds? That's what a reserve fund is for. When you take into account all these things, your detailed CGS cost then comes into play. On a prediction, or my prediction of the foreseeable future, 
in 2018, there were a number of indicators that there was a crisis coming, financial tsunami coming. The eight items you see there were all well-publicized indicators. Those have all happened. And at that time, we had an opportunity because we had an election in 2018 to hit the pause button and say, hey, whoa, what are we doing locally? Are we preparing for this? Council and the city ignored those indicators. In 2019, there were six additional indicators, this time from the U.S. government, the U.S. Treasury, the U.S. Economics Department, all serious international indicators. That was in 2019. Those were all before the city borrowed the 200 million. We had a chance at that point because Councillor Vagnini brought it up in council that we had had items one and two happen before we went out to borrow money. Those yield curves inverted. In the financial world, that indicates you have a recession coming. What is a yield curve? Well, yield curve is very simply the amount of interest that you get on lending money. The top curve there was in August of 2019, and it indicated that interest rates on a 10-year investment had fallen below the interest rate on a two-month investment. That's an inversion. Typically, your long-term investments pay higher interest rates than your low-term because they're trying to hedge their bets on increasing inflation in that. The second curve on the bottom was issued in September, and both of these were in, uh, issued by the Treasury, Department of Treasury in the U.S. And at that time, the 10-year interest rate dropped below the two-year interest rate. That was the time when the counselor warned counsel the interest rates are inverted. We have, we've got to hold off on this. To further that, council could not get a loan for the 200 million. They did not get one proposal to lend us, as a city, $200 million. So instead, they negotiated a bullet debenture, which they signed for at the end of February. Now, you will hear that it was signed for in March at a council meeting. We were told, and they were told in council, that the finance department of our city had already signed the deal in February, prior to council approval a gross error. So what's the public vision for 2021? Well, we'd all like to see smooth financial sailing. However, the reality is it's impossible to sail submerged in an undertow. That undertow hasn't begun yet, but it will be. However, before we can blame council and before we can blame the city, we have to look at what have we done? Have we fulfilled our constitutional obligations? And as you can see, these people are not quite as happy as they were in the first two pictures of them. Did they do their obligations under the Canadian Constitution? Well, under the Canadian Constitution, they need to ensure that the directions to councillors are clear. Have they done that? Well, the 2018 election would appear that they didn't because, or the councillors ignored it. They need to monitor, we need, as taxpayers, we need to monitor the job performance of every councillor. Are they doing what we directed? If they aren't, why not? Have they been doing that? I haven't heard of anybody doing it. Maybe they have been on telephone calls, but it's certainly not public. And. Probably most importantly, they need to monitor the value for fund, of funding. They've been doing that. All of us taxpayers are saying we're not getting what we're paying for. And we're saying why not? Well, if we're not getting the value for our funding, we need to be talking to our counselors and making sure they got the message. Have we been doing that? The bottom line of it is we have as much responsibility as taxpayers as the councillors do and as city staff does for the mess that we're facing. 
So what, how do we prepare for this tsunami? Well, the underflow is starting. Let's prepare now to minimize that reality. Tell your counselor to pause the wants and prepare a bottom-up zero-based budget prioritizing needs before wants. We have to have those needs satisfied to continue to live our lifestyle and even then it's going to be diminished. And the other thing that we need to do is as voters, you need to join us for phase two presentation of taxpayer capacity to be live streamed on July 23rd at 6 p.m., the same time.